Hello everyone, my name is Andy Hill and as the CEO of New Vision Biotherapies, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar and introduce you to Mr. Samir Hamada, who will chair the webinar, introduce the participants and moderate the question and answer session. Mr. Hamada is a highly trained and experienced corneal surgeon with 18 years experience in ophthalmology, both here in the UK and internationally. He has completed cornea and anterior segment fellowships at the Birmingham and Midland Eye Centre, Wolverhampton Eye Infirmary, and QVH's corneoplastic unit and eye bank. Mr. Hamada also completed a fellowship in paediatric ophthalmology at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. He devotes a lot of time to developing new innovations for managing patients with cornea and ocular surface diseases. Mr. Hamada has a special interest in managing corneal problems in children, including corneal transplantation for babies born with congenital eye diseases. He looked after babies and children with complex cornea and ocular surface diseases at Great Ormond Street before joining QVH. Thank you, Samir, for acting as moderator. I'll hand over to you. Uh, Andy, thank you very much, and thank to New Vision. Um, I have to thank New Vision for uh, facilitating this educational event seminar. Um, it's, it's an amazing topic, um, and it's we got um, amazing speakers tonight. Um, the, just to, to give you the uh, outlines, so the first two speakers, uh, Fran Professor Francesco Figueredo and uh, uh, Professor Sajad Ahmad, they both will be presenting. Uh, Mr. Alfi meant to be with us, but unfortunately he had emergency. So uh, I'll try to go through his presentation, and then we're gonna run a question and answer session uh, the last at, at, at the end. So uh, without further delay, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker. That's Professor Francesco Figueredo. Uh, he's very well known to all of us, consultant ophthalmologist in Newcastle Eye Center, Royal Victoria Infirmary. Uh, he obviously one of the top specialists in cornea surgery. Uh, ocular surface disease. He is also honorary professor in ophthalmology in Newcastle University, and his main research interests uh, are around corneal disease, stem cells, uh, corneal transplantation, keratoconus, ocular allergies, and, and so many others. So, um, uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Figueredo's uh, pre recorded uh, lecture today. Good evening. Um, I would like to thank uh, Sami Hamad for invite me to give this talk on amniotic membrane transplantation in ocular surface burns in this webinar tonight. I have no financial interest to declare. Just a few, a few important points on chemical burn. Ocular burns constitute a true ocular emergency. Chemical burn represents a potentially blind ocular injury, injury. That's why it's so important. That's why we're talking about this tonight. Worldwide, the commonest cause is exposure to alkali and acid from occupational accidents in industry and agriculture. But it's also very important to note there are some a lot of domestic accidents and the number of assaults well known in the UK as acid attack has increased significantly, especially in, in the northeast of England. Burn severities relate to the surface area of contact with the chemical engine, exposure time, and the degree of penetration. Alkalis tend to penetrate more effectively than acids. Severity grading classification provides prognostic guidelines based on the corner appearance and the extent of limbo ischemia, but also guides treatment. Clinical appearance of perilimbo area is the most reliable predictive factor of injury extent and outcome. Roper Hall classification since its introduction has been used as a benchmark. Estimated incidence of severe chemical burns in the UK is 0.02 per 100,000. This is a date from MacDonald and colleagues uh, published in the BGO in 2009. Between 11.5 and 22.1% of all eye injuries are caused by chemical burns, most victims being young and male. Two thirds, 66.7% of injuries were in males of working age. Half, 5% occur at work, two thirds by alkali, much more frequent than acid. Assault account for one third of severe injuries. Poor use of protective eyewear and lack of education, first aid management is a very important point in the management of ocular surface. In terms of pathogenesis, the severity of injury depends upon, upon 
up on type, pH, volume, concentration, duration of exposure, degree of penetration of the chemical, and first aid treatment. Damage is related to the rate of penetration due to the cell membrane disruption. As you know, the alkalis tend to be disruptive of the cell, the damage the cells much easier in a way that they can penetrate deeper. And as you can see here, these are the most common alkali uh, that cause chemical injury to the eye, and ammonia is the most frequent one in the UK. There are obviously some must present as well. The lymph stem cells become quite important when I talk about chemical burns because they are the crucial area of the ocular surface that if damaged will result in permanent and severe consequence for the eye. Uh, the limbo area produces the corner epithelial cells and they provide contact inhibition on the conjunctival epithelial cells to prevent it from migrating into the corner. And therefore, they're very crucial to keep the corners clear. In terms of management of the chemical burn, the first aid is delivered at the site of incidence, uh, bystander, etc. Then it is very important that whatever it happens, you don't need to, to rush to anywhere. Just make sure you get water and wash the eye very, very carefully, extensively to make sure you get rid of all the chemicals as much as possible. Contaminated clothes should be removed. Obviously, when you get to the emergency department, you need to check the the pH. This is very important because you determine the the management and the as a prognostic factor for severity as well. Irrigation with at least one liter of saline if the patient is abnormal. Continue irrigation until the pH returns to normal at seven. At seven. Sweep deep into the upper and lower phonics with the raw cotton bud to remove any particles of the chemical that's left behind. Recheck pH every 50 minutes for more than an hour and make sure that the pH is back to normal. Wait some 20 minutes, half an hour, check it again to make sure it remains normal because sometimes they can still uh, return to higher levels or lower levels depending on the chemical. Classify extent and grade of the chemical injury using rope hall or the dual classification depends where what we are more familiar with record properly including full extent of the epithelial loss and both corner and conjunctiva record degree of limb ischemia this is very important to determine the severity of the chemical injury and obviously refer this patient to for acute management and usually you have to as some of these patients depending on severity we have to be admitted to hospital as I just mentioned, uh, there are two main classifications used for chemical burn, the classical and the classification, grade one to four, and the most recent one uh, having to do a classification, uh, but I think the most widely used is, is the Ropahol classification. Most grade three and all grade four are treated as inpatients, and they require, in my experience, amniotic membrane transplantation, plus resection of the perinibal conjunctiva, and this is a very important step as well to make sure you remove all the damaged tissue around the limbus because these damaged tissue are very inflamed and they'll cause further damage to the limbus stem cell, if not dead, by the, the chemical itself. These are just examples of patients with acute chemical burn. Just to highlight the points that I've just made in terms of look at the area of epithelial defect, or some of them extend beyond the limbus, including the conjunctiva. You, look at, you need to look at the areas of limb ischemia signs of hemorrhage, some of lack of vascularization, and this is absolutely crucial to determine the extent of the burn that will guide you in terms of treatment. Most of the, the treatment uh, to start with is medical, then it's important to use anti-inflammatory like dexamethasone or PRED40, 1%. It's important to use preservative-free medication in the management of the acute burn to reduce the further damage to the stem cell. Prophylactic antibiotic, we tend to use chlorophenic or minims four times a day. And then comfort and pain relief, lubrication drops if necessary, dilate the pupil, use the cyclopentolate 1%, minimum three times a day, and use oral anesthetic, or, or sorry, oral analgesics or non steroid if necessary. Supportive treatment using uh, ascorbic acid uh, very frequently, and this is very important to promote collagen synthesis and reduce the level of frustration. You can use uh, topical and systemic. Uh, sodium saturate to reduce uh, possibility of further damage to the to the ocular surface, to the epithelial cells, combined with doxycycline for the same reason. Sometimes the pressure that could be raised and you used to, need to use anticlocal medication. And some patients do use ceramide drops as well. Uh, and obviously, amniotic membrane transplantation depends on the level of burns. Like I said, if it is grade three or four, 
all grade 4 I use amniotomy bain transplant. If it is grade 3, it depends on the case, I use amniotomy bain transplantation as well. For grades 1 and 2, uh, normally we don't need to use amniotomy bain transplantation unless there are limitations in terms of frequency to use the medication. This just highlight the main topic of this uh, lecture is about amniotic membrane, and this is a placenta, and you can see the amniotic membrane here, and the chorion split by two, and this is the, 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 the mother, and you can see the amniotic membrane facing the baby itself, and this is just amniotic membrane on the surface of the eye. Uh, this was the first amniotic membrane that I used in my, in my practice in the UK, in Newcastle in 1998. Just a diagram showing exactly, again, the chorion, the stroma, the base membrane, and the epithelium. Obviously, uh, most of the preserved amniotic membrane, the epithelium will be not present, to be destroyed. They're not necessarily present. And then we are talking about base membrane and the stroma. Amniotic membrane was first used in eye surgery by the Roth in 1940 as a constructive replacement, I believe, in Hungary. And then it was first used in chemical burn by source here in the UK in 1946, 1947. And then was reported the ophthalmological society in the UK by Rope Hall in 1965, and then suddenly disappeared, you know, in the Western medical literature for almost like 30 years. And Schaefer Seng from Miami was the one who brought the amniotic membrane back into the scenario of you know, ophthalmology for management of ocular self disease back in 1995. Uh, we published a paper together with Schaefer Seng in 2000 uh, on the management of, of uh, burns. But there has, there has been a lot of publications since then. Amniotic membrane transplantation performed in the acute phase, zero to seven days, often an ocular self burn is reported to relieve pain, accelerate healing, and reduce scarring and blood vessel formation. Therefore, we recommend, this was the conclusion of our paper published in 2000, that we should aim to try to do amniotic membrane transplantation within the first week of the birth. Why use amniotic membrane? What are the properties the amniotic membrane has? The amniotic membrane is well known to facilitate epithelialization, then it's very important for wound healing. They can reduce inflammation as well. They can reduce vascularization geogenesis, reduce scar formation and fibrosis, maintain normal epithelial phenotype, protect against infection and antimicrobial, pain relief, and is immunoprivileged uh, membrane, therefore there's no need for uh, immunosuppression. You can store the amniotic membrane in different ways. You can do cryopreservation, you can you do lyophilization, low temperature vacuum drying, dehydrate, heat and thermal. There are other ways of, of uh, preserving the membrane. Here in the UK, we have mainly two ways. We used to have a third one, you know, the Procara, but I believe this is not available anymore. anymore. The most traditional one has been the cryopreserved amniotic membrane supplied by NHSBT that has been available since 1998. And more recently, Novision, uh, a spin off company from Nottingham University, produced the OmniLens and OmniGen. That's a low temperature vacuum operation, dehydrate amnion, and they have followed a protocol called TRAIL, and this is a patent from Novision, and then has been widely used, especially because it's quite easy to use uh, as in the in the clinics, not necessarily theater, because you put this on this especially modified only lens that's uh, a contact lens that is very easy to deliver in the clinics. The car preservation, the most common preservation method, different freezing media have been used, but most of them contain glycerol, culture medium, and antibiotics. A diverse large number of clinical and experimental studies confirm the safety and efficacy of this method. Process maintains hydration and tensile strength making it easy to handle, position, and secure the membrane in place. Cryopreserved amniotic membrane method preserves histology features and extracellular matrix better than dehydrated amniotic membrane. Preserves the signaling matrix that suppress MMPs and promote limbus stem cell proliferation and regeneration. The amniotic membrane supplied by, the NH by NHSBT has been available since 98. And the first report was in 2007, that was amniotic membrane transplantation for ocular disease, a review of the first 230 cases from the UK user group. A very short follow-up uh, for this data, data available only in 126 patients and almost 50%. Then, you know, at the time there was an urgent need for a full review that still stands of all the amniotic membrane used by NHSBT. That has not been done since 2007. In terms of the way to process the amniotic membrane when it's called preservation, very similar, you have to remove, the amniotic membrane is removed from the placenta and washes the cell line, decontamination, immersed antibiotic, 
and then the, the quantum area of the brain is cut into, into small square pieces, 2 by 2, 3 by 3, or 5 by 5, and put this in an ultrasonalized paper. And then the, the amount graft are placed in individual tubes and free solution added. The graft are then snap frozen at minus 8 for long term storage and issued to host on a dry ice. Then, like I said, it has been available since 1998. And I had the privilege uh, in 1998 to use the first amniotic membrane in the UK since Sorsby in 1946. And this was preserved amniotic membrane, as you can see the date here of the main brain. And this was still supplied at the time for the North, from the North Long Tissue Bank that today is NHSBT. The new vision amniotic, uh, like I said, is called Omnigen. Biological ocular transportation graft. Omni lens is the bespoke contact lens that holds omnigen at the ocular surface. That is, like I said, it's very used to use in the clinics. It's a low temperature vacuum evaporation to delicately dehydrate the tissue, not freeze or heat dried, which are associated with reduced quality and function. The omnigen come in, in different sizes. You know, the one we use in clinic. Uh, they come traditionally 12 millimeter, but there is a more recent one, 60 millimeter as well, that you can put with the only, only lens in the eye. And you can see it comes in different sizes as well for use in many different ways, similar to the cryopreserved amniotic membrane supplied by NHSBT. The surgical technique is not performed in a universal manner. There is always this argument if you have the base membrane should be up or, or, or base membrane should be down facing the cornea. And I always use base membrane facing up, the strong facing down, in all my case, inlay, overlay, or filling, I'm not going to be spread flat and trimmed. The surgical technique substrate, substrate via, via versus biological dressing, and this is just a diagram, as you can see here, this is as a dressing that you put on top of the, I'm not on top, on top of the corner, and when you use, when you use, sorry, this, when you use it as an inlay, use uh, filling the gap, in a way that the epithelial cells will grow over it, or if you do as a, as, as, a, as a patch or an overlay that you go over the corner, over the defect, you know, all the way until the, to the limbus. And by doing that, the epithelial cells regenerate under the amniotic membrane in a way the amniotic membrane will dissolve and disappear. And the inlay technique, they usually, the epithelial cell grows over it, and the amniotic membrane usually will stay, not necessarily dissolved. There are some complications, obviously, like any other surgery. You can have infection, you can have the lack, lack of its effect in a way that if you're trying to treat, up, for example, a persistent epithelial defect, it may not, may not resolve and you may need to use it again. The membrane can dislocate, even if it is on a contact lens, the membrane can come off and, and disappear, or if it is stitched, may not be stitched properly, they can, they can dislocate as well. And some of the hemorrhage, that's not necessarily something bad. And this is a case that uh, a patient that had the amniotic membrane transplantation, as you can see, after one week, uh, a second amniotic membrane had to be done because the first one dissolved, there was still a persistent epithelial defect. And this is a case where the amniotic membrane dislocated, and then obviously this had to be re uh, re re uh, re refixed. And obviously you can see here lots of hemorrhage on the amniotic membrane. This is not necessarily bad because this is like similar to serum drops that you provide to the patient. This is one of our publications that I did in collaboration with, uh, with a colleague, Mella, in, in Germany, that we collect all our consecutive cases uh, of chemical burns from 1998 to 2008. And then I have a set of 72 eyes at the time from 54 patients, uh, six female. Uh, the average age of this group of patients was 37.3 years old, seven asked to burn, the majority was alkaline burn, and foreign known etiology. In 37i, 51.4% amniotic membrane transplantation cryopreserved was applied with the first six days after transplantation. Limb involvement also influenced significantly the risk for an impaired fine of visual acuity. The timing of the amniotic membrane after the amniotic membrane transplantation after the trauma was significantly correlated with the final logma visual acuity. In other words, in other words, early intervention had usually better visual acuity at the end. Uh, complete 360 limbus stem cell deficiency occurred in 33 eyes, 45%, while partial limbus stem cell deficiency occurred in 21 eyes, almost 30%. Nine patients end up having limbus stem cell transplantation. Then our conclusion at the time was that amniotic membrane is an effective adjunctive treatment in the management of acute ocular chemical burns, 
to support epithelial healing and restore ocular surface integrity with potential to improve vision. However, long-term debilitated vision remains in those with severe burns complicated by limbus stem cell deficiency. In our experience, most patients with chemical injury grade 4, whole per whole grade 4, despite our best management, including amyotomy transportation, they most the cases still require uh, limbus stem cell transportation because they go to develop limbus stem cell deficiency. This is a second uh, project that we've done. A look at acute chemical burns uh, and limbus stem cell deficiency. This was a prospective study, single center done here in Newcastle. During a period of six months between April and October 2009, we collect all patients, all new patients arriving in the emergency service with acute burn was a recruit for this study. Our standard form was used for consistency in data collection. Each patient was reviewed by one of three corner specialists at the time within 24 hours of the presentation. Severity gradient of chemical eye injury at presentation used rope hopper classification, dual classification in all cases was the ophthalmology department at the IVI serves a population of 3 million people. 100,000 patients, including new and old, attend the eye department each year. A total of 11,696 patients attend the eye casualty during the study period six months. 98 patients present with chemical injury during this period. And it was 98 out of 3 million, or 6.53 patients per 100,000. Then there was an increased incidence of chemical injury presentation among all eye casualty attendants, uh, increased from 0 .0, uh, 0.46 as a report from Stephen Morgan from Sunderland in 1987. Our report in 2018 showed that double the incidence of chemical burns presented to the eye emergency service. And this is very important to know that. Most of the patients are young male and they are more prone to have work-related chemical injury with plaster account for majority of them. Young children tend to have domestic injury mainly due to washing machine liquid. Five out of seven children were younger than 10 years old. Most patients present on the same day of the, the chemical burn, 81%. Some people present uh, the next day and 8% present more than 24 hours. 91%, sorry, 92% of the patients wash their eyes at the time of injury. But 37%, 36 patients, still arrived in the eye emergency service after washing the eye with abnormal uh, pH that required further regulation in the eye department as an emergency. When you look at this group of patients, like I mentioned to you, 98 patients, then you see that most of the patients had grade one and a very small grade two, grade three, or grade four. Then in fact, we only had four patients with grade four and all four were assault and caused by then the proportion of May was 6%, and then you've seen that 52% was work late, but assault was only 6% in this data. Alkali was 78%, almost 8%. And as you can see, again, as we said before, it tend to be younger male patients. The majority of patients had unilateral burns, and then, and then just a small proportion had bilateral burn, 12 out of the 98 patients. And then when you look at the patient grade four, Roperhoff, we had four eyes, all of them uh, caused by attack. And as you can see, all four, despite our best management, they still developed total limbus stem cell deficiency that required uh, treatment with limbus stem cell transplantation at a later date. The conclusion of this particular study was our study shows comparable incidence of chemical injury among all ED, then it's still 0.84%. Incidence of severe chemical injury among the population was 1.44 per 100,000. Young male patients had work-related chemical injury with plaster. Young children tend to have domestic injury, tend to be minor problems. Grade 1, 2, and 3 Europa classification chemical injury had a very good prognosis without harm. Not all three, but majority. In all grade four, a young male, despite best management, including amyotomy transportation within a week, resulted in very poor outcome with significant total limbus stem cell deficiency. Obviously, it's only four patients, then obviously we need to carry on doing more work on that, and we are doing that as we speak. Then, in terms of uh, surgical management uh, for non acute, later on, not the acute treatment. Amniotomy brain is, is part of the amyotomy to use on this patient for the property that we explained to you before, anti-inflammatory, anti-scary, and anti-angiogenic. 
some of these patients may need stem cell transplantation. Uh, some of them may have got, may need keratoplasty even after the limb stem cell transplantation. If you do try to do coronary transplantation before limb stem cell transplantation doesn't work, the patient has limb stem cell deficiency, and obviously keratoplasty is also, also an option and late term, late treatment for this patient trying to restore. These are not the data, uh, not the work that we done from 2013-2017. This was looking at patients admitted to the hospital with acute chemical burns, 37 patients in total. Then year age uh, is still very similar to the previous study that we've done. The majority of male, as we did before, and the number of bilateral cases in this series increased increased quite significantly. Obviously, we're including patients with more severe disease, either grade three or grade four burns. And then, the, the, as you can see, almost 6% of those had bilateral burns, not unilateral, compared to the previous series that I showed you, when it include not just severe burns, but also mild burns as well. 11 patients, 29% were unemployed, 18 were laborer, 8.1% uh, were students, three patients were retired, and two were professionals. Uh, mean admission time was five days, mean follow-up time was 170 days, mean cost of admission was 2,500 pounds, five patients developed total or partial limb stem cell with this VHC, all being assault. And this is the data again, when you look at the burn, the majority of patients, 81% was caused by alkaline. And if you look at the type of injury, again, you can look at the severity of this patient uh, and then assault the, the well-known ASD attack is account for 40% of these patients. When we look at the, the what happened to this patient in terms of outcomes, the overall mean best correct vision acuity on the mission was 0.58. When we analyze the results per type of injury, the assault group presented the worst visual, visual acuity initially and then the last follow-up visit. Then the more severe one, the assaults tend to have worse vision presentation and worse vision long term. In terms of log map best correct visual acuity, the supergroup of patients with total limb stem cell deficiency remained very low at the, the last follow up. Since these patients developed opacification involved the visual acts, while patients with partial limb stem cell deficiency achieved better visual acuity. As you can see here, this is patients with total limb stem cell deficiency, worse visual acuity, uh, and comparing to patients with partial limb stem cell deficiency. And when you plot the where these injuries happen in terms of assault, uh, the majority of them happens in, in specific areas of Newcastle. These are deprived areas, and we are doing some more work on, on these patients that I'll show you later. We also collect the total average weekly household income based on their postcode and the estimation by off for national statistics. The statistical analysis demonstrates significant difference between the assault group and the work-related accident group, and between the assault group and the domestic accident. Then the, the, the average income for the assault group was lower than people that was at work or overall, and domestic assault as well. Conclusion, main causative agent in our study was alkali. Young men, once again, in the work age, being most frequently involved. Many patients required prolonged hospital admission and cost follow-up. The majority of cases were assault, mostly occurring unemployed patients. All limb stem cell deficiency cases were caused by assault. We believe that social economic factors play an important role in the cost severity and total cost of chemical injuries in the UK. Just a very... Uh, the small data here uh, showing the rise incidence of ocular chemical burns uh, secondary to assault in the northeast of England. This was a retrospective study of four consecutive cases of ocular chemical injuries secondary to assault presented to the Royal Veterinary Family between 2015 and 2020. Of the total, 1,116 patients presented to, their, to our emergency service for ocular chemical injury during the study period, nine patients, 126 eyes, endured these injuries secondary to assault. That is 8.1%. The mean age is still a little bit lower than before. That was 32 in the other study. Again, the majority of them are men and white men. 82% uh, belong to the white ethnicity. The ocular injury was in lateral in 60% and bilateral in 40%. Eight hours needed amniotomy transportation, several of which were hope all grades, uh, grade four, and one was grade three. Five of these patients progressed to total limb stem cell deficiency. 
again just highlight the point that I made earlier that despite the best management including I'm not going to make transportation grade 4 chemical burn uh, the majority of patients are presenting with stem cell deficiency and this is just to highlight the increased incidence of burns caused by attack in Newcastle between 2015 and 2020 and as you can see the number of assault has increased dramatically uh, more or less tripled over the last five years and you can see the majority still remains grade one, but you have certainly grade four in 8% of the cases. And then if you, if you look at the agent that caused the burn, the majority of the patients caused by alkali, and most of them is ammonia. Then in conclusions, a rise incidence of eye injuries caused by chemical assault, also known as acid attack, has been observed in young adult men over the past five years in the Northeast of England. This can be vision threatening and is a rather serious medical and social concern requiring full investigation to be able to increase public awareness, implement stricter regulations, better surveillance and means of preventing and provide adequate support to the victims. Ammonia is the most common chemical used. You can buy this very easily uh, in, the, in the retail shops. Grade one and two have good prognosis, whereas grade three and four can progress to total investment cell diffusion despite maximum treatment, including immunoglobin response. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Figueredo, for this is extensive review. Sorry, it's, we have to break it here just to give time to Professor Sajad Ahmad to give his talk and to have some discussion. I think the, the material presented very powerful and there's a lot of studies here, which is uh, really great information. But due to limited time, we have to, uh, uh, to run to the next presentation. So without further delay, very great pleasure to introduce Professor Sajad Ahmad. I'm sure most of us will know him. He is a consultant ophthalmic surgeon and the lead of experimental medicine at the world renowned Morfield Eye Hospital. Well, his expertise in cornea external eye disease, and uh, he's an honorary associate clinical professor at the Institute of Ophthalmology, University uh, College London. Uh, for research, he runs a laboratory group with expertise in corneal stem cell biology and development of cellular therapies for the eye. So uh, uh, thank you, Sajad, for coming today. I think you're going to tell us about simple lumbar epithelial transplantation. So it's all yours. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Samir, for the kind introduction. I'll keep this uh, brief because I know you um, were taking up some of your evening. So I'm going to talk about um, simple lumbar epithelial transplantation, which is uh, one of the um, techniques we, where we use uh, amniotic membrane, as you'll see in a moment. Um, now, uh, what I'll outline initially is the surgical flow that we use for limbal stem cell deficiency, and that's where SLET um, fills one of the gaps. I'll talk a little bit about the pre-surgical planning and then the steps for the, the actual procedure with videos. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about follow-up. Um, so in limbal stem cell deficiency, as you heard in the previous um, talk from Chemical Burns, what you get is um, a loss of corneal epithelial renewal, and you get persistent epithelial defects, and then you get conjunctivalization. And the eventual uh, outcome of that is loss of vision and also incredible pain from the, uh, the surface defects. Now, the aims of treating uh, limbal stem cell failure fall into primary aims and secondary aims. And actually, the secondary aim, which is often the patient's aim, and also is our eventual aim, is to improve vision. However, when we do, um, uh, when we treat stem cell deficiency, actually the primary aim is to stabilize the corneal surface and normal, normalize the corneal epithelium, and that enables corneal transplantation, conventional corneal transplantation, which fulfills the secondary aim. So actually your primary aim as a clinician is to normalize the, the corneal surface and separate the conjunctiva from the cornea again. Now, the important thing that you have to do is the bit before and the bit after. Actually, the surgical procedure isn't technically difficult, uh, but the bits before and the bits after are critical. Um, so the important thing is to counsel the patients, make sure your patients are compliant, and they understand that the, the process will require subsequent surgery. So uh, initially a SLET, followed by a corneal transplant, and possibly also for lid surgery, because often they get ptosis. Uh, in, in, for example, a chemical burn. You pick your cases that are suitable and effective for, for the procedure. And prior to the surgery, you control any inflammation, correct any lid malpositions and treat any dry eye. So you would then want to use 
systemic, uh, topical and or systemic immune suppression in the form of steroids. You would want to get uh, ocular plastic involvement for uh, fornix adhesions and any lid malposition, rectify that first, and then you would want to, in, in conjunction with that, treat any dry eyes and if necessary, use serum eye drops. Then you need to determine where you're going to get, where you're going to source your donor tissue from. So is the patient's uh, other eye a healthy eye where you can source the tissue and use an autologous source? or do you need to use a cadaveric or living related donor? And actually prior to this, which I haven't mentioned, you have to determine whether or not you actually need to do the procedure. If the central cornea is not involved, central three millimeters are not involved, you actually don't need to intervene surgically. You can manage them medically at, uh, with or without a, a, a contact lens. But if the central cornea is involved, you're almost committed to, to doing some sort, sort of surgical intervention. So this is the surgical flow we use, and you can see um, on the uh, on the left hand side, you can see partial uh, limbal stem cell deficiency and its treatments. The bit that I'm going to concentrate on is the total limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, where one of the treatment options for both unilateral and bilateral um, disease is SLET. Um, and in, in unilateral disease, it's obviously autologous, so it's auto SLET, and in bilateral disease, it's allogeneic. Uh, slept, allo slept, where you will need immune suppression. For the autologous one, you obviously don't. The technique was first described in 2012 by Vrenda Sangwan in India, and it was purely because uh, of the limitations of the cultured techniques that we have for uh, growing uh, limbal stem cells. And you can see here, essentially what happens is you, you grow your stem cells on the eye itself after using, doing a panectomy. And actually, the results are very comparable to CLET. There are about three quarters of your patients do well and a, and a quarter do not. And we still don't know why the quarter both in CLET and SLET do not do well. There is actually little data on that. So now to go on to the actual process of SLET, it's, it's very similar to the cultured techniques. The initial process is always a conjunctival pterotomy, 360 degrees, and I often do a, a, a recession. So we go uh, about two to three millimeters behind the limbus. This is followed by a panectomy where the conjunctival epithelium is removed from the corneal surface in, the similar, in a similar way that you do for pterygium surgery. Um, you then retrieve limbal tissue from the donor eye. So here I will show you an autologous procedure where the other eye is used as a donor. And I always use a three millimeter uh, a piece of tissue at 300 microns depth. Um, we then show you where uh, the actual, the, this is all the preparation for the procedure, but we then actually show you the, the, the surgical technique where amniotic membrane is put on the surface and the pieces are uh, separated and glued onto the surface with tissue glue. A contact lens is then attached and the conjunctiva is closed over above that contact lens, which sounds a bit unusual, but that contact lens stays in place and gets removed at two weeks after uh, surgery. So here you will see a 360 degree um, uh, pyritomy has been performed and you will see, uh, I'm ident we're identifying the, the actual um, plane where the conjunctiva is attached to the cornea and you'll see it gape open in a second. And this is all pretty much blunt dissection. Um, so once you've done this, you get a, a, a blunt instrument and you'll see in a moment, you do this dissection and eventually this panis comes away, leaving a beautifully uh, clear stroma in this case. So I'm just speeding it up for the sake of time, but you can see the, the pupil, uh, the iris uh, details and the iris edge here and once this is all peeled away, you then make sure that you've any bleeding around the uh, circumference, it, you've used diathermy. Uh, you don't want blood tracking under the amniotic membrane and the stem cells once you put them on. The next step is to perform a, uh, an explant procedure from the healthy eye. And this is a three millimeter uh, mark. Uh, this is a 300 micron guarded blade. You always dissect from the cornea back, not from the conjunctiva forward because of the bleeding that occurs and it doesn't help uh, the lamella dissection. So you always start at the cornea and you will then slowly go 
Um, it's like doing a reverse trabeculectomy. This is a pediatric crescent blade. Our usual crescent blade is not big enough. And actually the instruments that we use for this technique uh, are not big enough, uh, to, are not uh, small enough. Um, so we have to do, make do with, with a lot of pediatric instruments. So you dissect back and you can see here, this is a 300 micron uh, lamella dissection. Uh, we then uh, go on and do a, a conjunctival peritomy at this stage. And you'll see why um, I don't do the, um, the dissection from the conjunctiva in a second, because once you get to the conjunctiva, you get the bleeding and then this tracks in under your, uh, under your um, dissection and, and doesn't really help your view. Uh, particularly and also you don't want too much bleeding because you want those cells to to attach and blood can often can sometimes actually hinder it so you'll see here uh, and then you cl I close over the conjunctiva above this uh, uh, this defect with tenno nylon which then gets removed at about uh, two weeks time after surgery so this then gets closed over and then we go on then to the actual um, uh, SLEP procedure. So you'll see here the first step is to get the uh, amnion. So this is a, a piece of uh, omnigen, uh, and you can see it's the uh, epithelial side up, the stroma, uh, the stroma side down. Uh, we flatten it out. It's really important you flatten out the, the amniotic membrane for actually all the techniques that you've heard about this evening, because cells grow over flat surfaces. Cells find it very, epithelial cells find it very difficult to go uphill. So you want to make sure this is flat. So we spend some time doing this. It's actually um, glued in place with tissue glue. And we use, uh, I use four tacking tenovipral sutures at, the, diff uh, at uh, the top and bottom corners, like so. And then what we do is, this is just peeling it back and then gluing it and, and actually just like wallpapering it into place. You'll see here, this is the biopsy that we re retrieved from the donor eye. So we divide this into at least, uh, at least eight to 16 pieces. I, the, more the, the more the better. And you go half and half and half. If you start at one end, it becomes quite difficult to dissect because these are small pieces. And I actually find the feather blade the easiest to do this. So you eventually get these small pieces. <clears throat> and then you put them onto the amniotic membrane and you just basically slide them all on and then uh, place them all the way around. Once you've done that, you then put some glue on. So this is the tissue glue and you put uh, the um, different components on separately. And then you'll put the, the other, the bit on and eventually, you'll see that the, the glue um, uh, basically sets like, it's also almost like candle wax. And when it's set like that, and you leave it about three minutes to do that, you put this contact lens on top, and then you put two tacking stitches over the contact lens. Um, and then you leave this in place for about two weeks. After the treatment, after the surgery, there are two schools of thought. Either you use only oral medication or you use topical medication. So if you're gonna use oral medication, you close the eyelids either with a, a, a temporary tarsorophy or with steri-strips, and then you give the patient oral prednisolone or oral doxycycline um, for, a, for a short month's course. Um, if you're gonna to use topical drops, obviously you have to be unpreserved, and we use steroids and antibiotics as we do with other uh, most other ophthalmic surgery. <clears throat> At two-week follow-up, you remove the underlying bandage. Contact lens is actually extruded out slightly, so it's easy to find the edge. You assess the outgrowth from the limbal pieces and the extent of any residual defect, and then you put an overlying bandage contact lens, sometimes a very large one, um, for about a month, or you can do a Botox ptosis at that stage. And then you assess success at about three months for definite, but about a month you will know which way things are going. And, and, and as I say, often it does, does very well. So this is a patient at two week follow up. You can see the bits of uh, explant still attached and you'll see in green the, def the residual defect, but you can see there's growth from, the, from some of the pieces. And you'll know that if you leave this for another few weeks, they will do very well. 
So to summarize, for patients that you select for SLEP, the pre-surgical planning is critical and choosing the appropriate patients is key. You want to have someone who's going to comply with treatment, come to the surgery, attend your post-op visits, and also eventually have a corneal transplant if they need it for vision. It's a safe and simple surgical method and should always be used as a first modality. It's um, much less cumbersome than the cultured methods that we have and also much less, uh, it's less expensive. And unilateral and bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency can be treated in this way. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sajad. Very neat, clean, simple like a simple, simple stereo transplantation, make it look really easy to do, which it is as in your hands. Um, questions, um, shall we go to uh, Francesco talk first, just have a bit of discussion about it, just for a couple of minutes, if that's okay with you. Um, so uh, uh, what your thoughts on using the AMT versus the new biologics, especially we're talking about um, mesenchymal stem cell derived chemokines, cytokines, there's a lot of products, which is actually essentially, it's coming from the amniotic membrane. It's the, the juices use it instead of using the physical amniotic membrane. Do you think it's time to move on to look at other modalities of uh, managing uh, the cell surface, helping these epithelial to proliferate, migrate, mature, etc.? Definitely. I mean, I think we don't have... Um, um, the, the, one of the problems is we've not characterized amniotic membrane and, and in fact serum very well from a proteomics point of view and actually the studies lack that um i i think amniotic membrane now is so good and omnigen comes you know it's off the shelf so it's very easy for us to utilize in theater that we should consider having add-ons to it so you know do we add on for example nerve growth factor how although it's expensive, but for, as an example, do we add growth factors onto amniotic membrane um, and uh, rather than just drops, because as soon as the drops are on, uh, a significant proportion will be washed away. Okay. Uh, now, you know the AMT, do you give attention to the position in lay or overlay? Do you, do you bother which way it is? So I actually always, I, th I think actually Francisco mentioned it, I always put it, uh, with the uh, basement membrane up and stroma down. Um, for inlays, um, for for example, in patients that have uh, blind eyes with pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, I, I think and I feel that the epithelium has to grow over basement membrane, so you give it the best opportunity. Therefore, the basement membrane should be up. For an overlay, I don't think it, the basement membrane matters so much, so I'm not so sure it, it, it's that vital for um for an overlay however uh for consistency sake i always do it the same way just to make it less complex yeah i, I agree with you this is my approach as well for the same reasons you mentioned uh, and also i believe sometimes when you talk about use it as as a substrate as the epithelium i uh, sorry the basement membrane uh, i believe the role of the amniotic membrane is really to promote the epithelium healing uh, proliferation, the migration, and then that will itself will produce its own substrate on present membrane, yeah. rather than actually the MT itself stay there. But again, someone need to prove that. But uh, yeah, good. So shall we move to your great talk about SLED? So uh, obviously, uh, I just want to make it. Uh, uh, I mean, I like the first couple of slides you put on because it really, really is important. Not all of us doing SLED in the country. I think it's important that before the patient goes for uh, this major surgery, let's call it, because this is a, a, you're reconstructing the ocular surface, are this patient uh, optimized in, an, in advance? And as you said, sometimes it's early management. You don't have to go that far by doing stem cell transplantation. So... Uh, what, you mentioned a couple of things. Could you just repeat those in kind of what at what stage you think a patient should really go, come refer to say Morfield or to East Greenstead to have a slit or or comet or what other stem cell transplantation? So so it has to be when the when you so the prep bits are very important. There's no point referring someone who you think is not compliant. DNAs doesn't use their drops um, and you suspect that will not you know will not come to surgery or attend, especially if they're coming from a long distance, they're unlikely to attend. If they can't come to you locally, they're not gonna attend someone, someone far away. 
The second thing is you need to have a, an eye that's optimized for surgery. So it has to be an eye that's quiet, relatively quiet. Now, none of these eyes are completely quiet, but as quiet as you can get it. And, and that involves often, if you have, a, for example, a chemical injury, it can often take about a year before the eye is quiet enough. And there's no point in having surgery early on um, after a chemical burn because for, for, in the form of slet or sealet because uh, all that happens is the metalloproteinases that are in the tear film and in the stroma basically just digest your tissue that you've put on uh, and so undo, the, undo all your uh, and the patient's hard work. So for that reason, you leave it for a, a good period of time, about a year, and actually in the, in the multi-center holoclast studies, we, uh, we, we were told to leave them for two years prior to any surgery. So uh, if they're not quiet by that stage, then you consider a, a short course of oral steroids. And I often do that for hot eyes prior to surgery. Okay. I mean, you're right saying that. It's just because uh, the slit, basically, it's in vivo expansion of cells, isn't it? So you want to optimize the, the environment. These cells are grown in the eye bank for three weeks to get the sheet. Basically, if you do ex vivo, you expect that you have that optimization on the surface so they can grow the way you wish. Okay, good. So uh, still, still on that point, you uh, come to your surgery. Very nice presentation videos. Thank you for those. Uh, you you put the amniotic membrane on the surface. Is that Omnigen you use there in that? Yeah, that's Omnigen. I actually used to use, I have to say, uh, Andy, if he's listening in, uh, Andy Hopkins, I used to use um, uh, the fresh frozen, mm -hmm. so the cryopreserved stuff. And mm -hmm. it, uh, it um, because I'd use it for such a long period of time for my uh, ex vivo expanded stuff, and also then for my slet, and I was happy with the technique, I was very reluctant to move on to mm -hmm. Omnigen. However, I, I use Omnigen for various overlays first, and we had to tweak it a bit for slet, mm -hmm. but eventually uh, i think slet works uh, the slet works just as well with omnigen if not much more easily than it does with the uh, fresh frozen stuff fresh frozen stuff if anyone's remembers handling it is, is difficult to handle compared to omnigen absolutely and i think you you rightly say that the epithelial cells like to have a smooth surface they don't like going uphill and with the omnigen is more likely you can get that nice smooth surface which is uh, exactly what you want in these cases and you, so you put that, that's fine. Then you put those small pieces and then you glue them. Some people argue that the glue will stop the epithelial migration. Do you have any views on that? Is that the observation of that? Um, not really. I, I, I mean, how, I, I'm not sure how else you're going to get the pieces to stick. Mm -hmm. um, and so the only way to do it is with glue. Mm -hmm. um, there's no other ideal way of doing it. And, and certainly in... in in my hands and I've been doing it now for about five years. Mm -hmm. um, the technique works well. I don't think the glue makes any difference. In fact, the glue is needed and I suspect it actually helps it. Mm -hmm. Because okay. remember when, when, when we get the holoclar from on the, which is the uh, product from Italy, which is the ex vivo expanded stuff that comes on fibrin glue anyway. So this is not too dissimilar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you probably would, could say Sometimes if you do membrane on top as well, if that's another way, but I personally do the same, actually, I put the gluing and membrane top. What's your view then on putting those pieces on straight on the bare stroma rather than putting membrane and then the pieces on top? Have you tried those? Because we, in East Greenstead, we do that. And I have to say, we, we got fairly good results with those cases. I think it depends on how bad the burn is. Um, and, and the reason I say that is that I remember referring a patient to who was, from, was actually from Holland and was, hit, was based here, but then moved back. And they had a persistent epithelial defect after a chemical injury. And, mm -hmm. I, and I remember speaking to Garrett Mellis and the epithelium was just stuck there. I'd done an amniotic membrane, everything. And he said, we do a basement membrane, we do a Bowman layer transplant. And, and I was like, why would you do that? And actually he was doing exactly what we do with amnion is we prepare, we put a basement membrane down for cells to grow. In a severe chemical burn, there is significant stromal injury as well. And therefore I suspect that the stroma is not conducive to, to, is not optimized for epithelial growth. Whereas if you put a, uh, an amniotic membrane down, you know that that's a basement membrane for epithelium. So I feel a little bit more confident. I haven't tried it on bare stroma before. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I, I think personally, I think you're right. If if the surface is very damaged, if the stroma is very damaged and membrane on top will be better. If it's smoother, then yes, you can do either way. Um, Sajad, have you tried to do combined surgery in those cases? Say uh, if you, uh, with, PK, with PK, you mean? Yeah, PK or SALK or DALK or any of those? Uh, yes, I have. Um, and only out of uh, necessity. I try to prefer, I always say to patients, I prefer to do a little many times than give massive surgery. Sometimes those eyes, which you, which are often, you, you have your arm twisted because the cornea has got perforated mm -hmm. uh, and you know they've had a severe chemical burn. So actually they need, uh, they need their stem cells replaced and they need their cornea replaced. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're forced to do it, but they, these are hot eyes, often mm -hmm. loads of surgery in these often damaged eyes already damaged eyes, make them fire th physical. So I tend to avoid it unless I have to. Yeah. Are you still doing KLAL? KLAL? Uh, I haven't done one for a, for at least six, seven years. Okay. Do you think there's That's... any benefit from doing, when you're doing alloslet, is the remaining for KLAL as a addition? I see, because you still, the immunogenicity would be the same, isn't it, in this case? So past some of us, so, with allo slits, a slightly tricky thing because we don't really know. The question that we don't really know is, do we put, um, is it better for us to do a, a slit with allogeneic tissue and just put loads of it on, chop up loads of it and just put it on? Or does that increase the immunogenicity and therefore result in a great, greater risk of rejection? And the answers, no one has the answer. They've done loads in, as you know, they've done the most in India, and we still don't know the answer because that, that question hasn't been asked. And I mm -hmm. think it's an, for allogeneic seat slept, it's a very important question to address. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if adding in more allogeneic tissue would be better. Mm -hmm. I think you're probably right in what you say because uh, the same when you do corneal transplantation, the less tissue, they make less rejection than other procedure, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I have one more question then. I think we have uh, another question, very important question from the audience. So uh, when you do a slit, I mean, in my patients, we talk about doing slit and they come say, those patients come with monoocular. So they have one eye, unilateral disease. Yeah. Often reluctant that I take the tissue from their good eye to do slit. And sometimes they're quite happy. Either I do comet or I do uh, alloslet. What, what's your view on that? I mean, do you feel, find this sometime with the patient? Because we offer them options and often they, want, they don't want to touch the good eye. You know, these patients are a little bit reluctant that they don't want to touch their good eye. I, th I have to say, I used to find patients would do that. And I, I sense it was actually uh, because I was cautious of it, not the other way around. So I was... My, my cautiousness was, uh, you know, the patient was taking it on board. And now, as I've done, so, you know, so many auto slats, I feel comfortable um, that, you know, in auto, auto slat, we take more tissue than we do for a cultured procedure. So now that I've done enough, I feel very confident, certainly touch wood, I've not had any issue with the, uh, with the donor eye. And, um, and I would probably, uh, I would prefer to give them an auto slet than an allogeneic slet or mm -hmm. comet even, because I think the outcomes are so much better. Okay, okay, good, good. We didn't have time to talk about comet, but um, I have my observation on using comet and I feel comet sometimes, especially those severe cases, that's why reserve for severe cases, which is, uh, you probably know in Instead, we only get that in the stage kind of ocular surface disease. I found comet rehabilitated surface very nicely and give you that a new anatomy, a new limbus, if you like. Then you could follow that with a slit or other technique, which I think works really well. Yeah. Those, I'm talking about those severe cases as well, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think the comet, what, it, the, what comet does that limbal tissue doesn't do is provide goblet cells or mucin producing cells that probably helps the tear film and, and I think it probably is very good for when you have a fornix um, at symblephron to, mm -hmm. to use so there's you know there's a few series out now with mm -hmm. where they've used uh, ex vivo expanded oral mucosa comets essentially for mm -hmm. fornix reconstruction prior to limbal procedures mm -hmm. to try and optimize the tear film amazing 
we could ask you so many questions. It's an interesting topic and we could go on and on for, forever. I just have a question here, which is about the post-op treatment for after a slit. So the question, how frequently do you need to install steroids in immediately post the uh, slit? Maybe you could just, because you said you either don't use topical treatment or you do, can you just highlight if you just rely on topical and do you join together? So I use topic, if I, I only use topical um, uh, in the um, stem cell studies that we did with in the Holocaust study, which was the, was the European study, they wanted everyone to use oral treatment. So we used oral steroids, uh, mm -hmm. 20 milligrams for two weeks and oral doxycycline for a month. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And actually, it makes sense because it's essentially it's oral steroids and using steroids and antibiotic, which is effective on the, on the eye. However, I tend to use topical stuff. I like to um, I like to see the patient the day after and then two weeks after. So I like to see what's going on, whether the, you don't want them coming the day afterwards and for the explants to have fallen off. And then mm -hmm. I want the patient to start to instill the drops to understand that they need to be compliant with them long-term. So I, I tend to use um, hourly for the first three days, two hourly for two weeks, and then four times a day after that, which is pretty much what I do for all my high-risk corneal transplants as well. So it's the same thing. And if you want to give them immunosuppression treatment, what's your uh, regime on that? Uh, for the allogeneic, mm -hmm. uh, so mycophenolate, one gram twice a day. Okay, cool. That's more or less what we do as well. Perfect, good. So you know what? This discussion is really amazing. And it just showed me that actually we could have another session just to go through like case days, basically, like have a various examples and how we approach each of those examples from, from the mild to moderate to severe ocular surface failure. Because I think every ophthalmologist, when they look at this case, they feel, okay, from where I am, I'm a DGH, I'm in an institution with the high expertise, what I can handle, what I need to do at, at that level. So that would be a good approach as well and make it easy to understand the logic of reconstructive ocular surface and stem cell transplantation. So that's great, Sajad. Thank you so much. And um, I think we, we run by over by five minutes, but it's great. Um, so... Uh, I don't think we, there's more questions. I would like to thank uh, you, Sajad. Thanks, Francesco. And thanks to Muhammad, who did efforts to prepare a presentation, but unfortunately couldn't present it. Um, and thanks for New Vision to arranging that. Thanks to all the uh, people who attended today after their hours long day. So uh, hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yes, bye.